The person sitting in front of you is a 35-year-old woman by the name of Cassandra Waller. Cassandra is currently being questioned at the Pensacola Police Department regarding the recent disappearance of her then-girlfriend, Taylor Wright. Just before we can analyze this interrogation, it is important to understand the events that led up to this moment. So, we need to start about 10 days earlier. On September 8, 2017, at around 10 a.m., a 36-year-old woman by the name of Taylor Wright was waiting at the front door of her and her girlfriend's house for her friend Ashley MacArthur to come and pick her up. Taylor Wright was then witnessed by her girlfriend Cassandra Waller as Taylor enters Ashley's vehicle and drives away. The two girls were heading out to run some errands together, but after a few hours had passed, Taylor began replying to Cassandra's messages in a way that caused concern. Cassandra could immediately recognize that the messages being sent felt as if they were not coming from Taylor. The speech patterns were unfamiliar, and the messages being sent were totally out of character. Eventually, the communication stopped completely. A few days went by, and Cassandra still could not get a hold of Taylor. So, she speaks to Ashley, but Ashley claims that Taylor went home after going shopping. So, on Thursday, September 14th, six days after Taylor disappeared, Cassandra visited the Pensacola Police Department to fill out a missing persons report. While speaking to the officers, Cassandra stated that this behavior was extremely out of character for Taylor, and that the two were in a good place within their relationship. So, she believed that Taylor running away without any contact is not likely at all. She also stated that normally Taylor was very active on social media and very responsive to calls or texts, yet Taylor had not been replying or using social media at all. Four days after filing the report, on September 18th, Cassandra was then contacted by police and asked to attend the Pensacola Police Department again, this time to take part in an interview. And so... That's exactly what she did. Investigators had obtained zero evidence at this point. So following standard police protocol, they focused on trying to eliminate Taylor's spouse as a suspect first. They began the interview by setting up the room to immediately apply some pressure on Cassandra. They did this by positioning themselves between the door to the room and Cassandra herself. This is a very simple yet effective technique that provides the illusion to Cassandra that in order to leave this room, she needs to go through them. Not only that, these officers strategically placed their handcuffs on the table directly in front of Cassandra. This can also be an effective maneuver to indicate to her that they have already prepared themselves to make an arrest, should they be given any reason. Also, before entering this interrogation room, the investigators had already asked Cassandra for her cell phone. They had not yet had the opportunity to search through it, so they decided to bring it into the interrogation room with them and use it as a tool to dangle in front of her. So this is your personal cell phone. Okay. If you're okay with that, just sign right there. After getting written permission to search Cassandra's phone, this officer then leaves the room and simultaneously browses through its contents, while the other officers continue the questioning. The last day that y'all were together, can you kind of walk me through that day? Woke up, she made me breakfast. She made me like eggs and bacon and stuff, and she was in no hurry for anything. You know, just like a normal morning. I said, well, we'll go to the grocery store. I'll pick up some stuff. We'll have wings tonight. And um, that was that. She was like, okay, well, Ash is coming over. We're going to go to Ash's bank, and we're going to pick up my money and stuff out of the safety deposit box. So as I was getting in my car, Ash had pulled up, and I was like, all right, you know, we hugged, we kissed, said love you. I went my way. Any other plans, errands they had to run? No. But when Taylor wouldn't text me back, um, I text Ash and I was like, Ash, like, where are you guys at? Because I thought that they were just going to run to the bank. That's the only thing I knew of that day. Finally, Ash called me and Ash was like, hey, we're up at my mom's house, which is up in Milton. They own a farm. She was like, you know, Taylor's broke down and cried twice today. I'm like, what is going on? Ashley would have the capability or the means to farm. I don't know, I don't know that well. I can't answer that, I don't know. Just a second, 
The officers then decided to step out of the room briefly to discuss some interesting information that the first officer uncovered while searching through Cassandra's phone. Cassandra then has a sudden realization regarding Ashley's potential motive. Hey, can I please call Mel? Because he's bothering me sitting in here and I'm just... What's she asked? So, Taylor, it seemed like she was getting paranoid. She was talking about how she felt like something just wasn't right with Ashley. She wasn't sure if Ash had her money or not. Because Taylor had been trying to get the money out of Ash's safety deposit box. Taylor said for like four or five days. And I was like, Taylor, you know, she's probably been really busy. But she goes, no, cash. She goes, like, I'm telling you, something just doesn't feel right with me. I don't want to think this, but, like, I want to give you guys, like, whatever you guys need. We want, we I want, can be so wrong. No, but I, I'd rather you be wrong and have a feeling or know something to tell us. I don't want Ash to be mad at me, though, because I, like, Ash maybe accuse her or something. Ash doesn't even know anything. Cassandra went on to explain that Taylor had given Ashley a cashier's check for $34,000. Taylor had done this after finding out that Ashley had a safety deposit box. So, Taylor was just having Ashley place the check into the deposit box for safekeeping. At this point, officers still hadn't made the transition from handling this as a missing persons case to treating it as if it is now a homicide investigation. However, this new information regarding a large amount of money caused them to believe that something more sinister could be going on. So, their first move was to obtain a warrant and search through Ashley MacArthur's bank account transaction records. They contact her bank, Wells Fargo and quickly find out that Ashley did not even have a safety deposit box, and that she had recently deposited a check for $34,000. After reviewing the records, they found out that Ashley actually transferred all of that money into several different accounts in her name, leaving her primary account at Wells Fargo with a balance of $0 less than 24 hours after that money was made available to her. Investigators were also able to get their hands on the exact check that Ashley deposited. That check had Taylor Wright's signature on it. However, when comparing that signature to any of Taylor's other signed documents, it appeared as if it was forged. After making these discoveries, investigators felt that they were likely on the right track to uncovering what exactly happened to Taylor. So, they then obtained a warrant to request Ashley MacArthur's cell phone usage and location history from her service provider. While reviewing this data, they found that on the evening that Taylor went missing, Ashley's cell phone was pinging off of towers that correspond with a large farm property that belongs to her family, in Contonement, 30 miles away from where the two stated that they would be stopping in Milton. Investigators then quickly obtain a warrant to search this property, hoping to find any physical evidence linking Ashley to Taylor's disappearance. Throughout all of this, officers had only spoken to Ashley on one occasion. Ashley was calm, cool, and collected, and even somewhat giddy or flirtatious. On said occasion, officers chose not to disclose any of their initial discoveries to Ashley and allowed her to tell her story. Do you know who harmed Taylor? No, I don't. I don't believe Taylor's been harmed. I just, I think Taylor's doing what Taylor does. I mean, this is a teen in the they then took note of her sequence of events and let her go. However, after obtaining the search warrant to search the farm property, investigators asked Ashley to attend the police department again for a second interview. This time, they arranged to have a search team search the farm property while they questioned Ashley, leaving Ashley completely unaware that this is taking place. Before we ask you any questions, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You understand that? We found some, some bank records that drew some questions. Um, can you tell me anything about you and, and Taylor and any sort of involvement with any businesses? What happened to this money after you left? Um, a lot of it I used because it was payment for us. When we started plotting all the phone calls that you and Taylor were making that day, um, 
There are some discrepancies in what you had told us. Where is Taylor at? I have no idea. You need to tell us where she's at. I don't know where Taylor is. I don't have a clue. Do you have any ideas, anyone that we can go talk to? President Fuller, we've already, already talked. Has your mind changed at all? Do you feel any different? Have you thought about any other ways that this could have went down? Not really. Have you ever had to sign her name to a check? And you know, do you recall how much the cashier check was for? I think 30. And she or you deposited that? I I actually deposited all of the checks for her. Where is she at? I don't know where she is. Where is her body at? I don't know where she is. She's dead, though. We I know don't that. believe that. So you're the only I one that was with her on this day at this farm that you did not disclose to us? I didn't do anything to her. tell you this, if she's at that farm, we're going to find her because we're executing a search warrant out there right now. Well, I want to go back to the, the cow stuff. This right. Well, it totally could be explained on this one. Yeah, that's why. That, that thing, this is the, do you know whose signature that is? Mm, it does Taylor's name, but it doesn't really look like her signature. Would you have maybe wrote her name on there by chance? Well, is that clearly Taylor's signature? Give me a second. Don't cross your legs and look Don't let us tell your story. Because we're going to, this is going to tell us what happened. Don't let us tell it something that may not be true. I think at this point I need an attorney because it seems to me that y'all think that I did something to her. I respect that. Sit tight and go from there, okay? After about four and a half hours of interrogation, Ashley MacArthur was still free to leave, as the search of the farm property had yet to uncover any damning evidence. However, it was not long before it did. While looking through the woods surrounding the farm property, a member of the search team discovered a pile of fresh-looking potting soil and concrete, covered by branches in a random location. They then moved the branches and pushed the dirt around, and uncovered what appeared to be a human skull. After digging further, they found the rest of the skeletal remains of a young woman. The remains were already very decomposed, making it nearly impossible to identify if this is or isn't Taylor. However, the officers did locate what appeared to be a necklace alongside the remains. This necklace was quickly recognized by one of the investigators as a necklace he had seen Taylor wearing in a photo of her that he had previously viewed. Ashley MacArthur was then arrested and charged with the first-degree premeditated murder of Taylor Wright. And about two years later, on August 26, 2019, Ashley's trial began. Ashley pled not guilty. So this case involves a lot of different pieces of information and a lot of different witnesses. So what I'm about to do for you in my opening statement, hopefully, is give you a very general outline of what this case is about. And then as you hear each witness testify, and as you see each exhibit and each piece of evidence, it's going to fill in the details of the outline for you. And when it all comes together, um, what you will see at the end is that Taylor Wright was murdered by this defendant, Ashley MacArthur. And really what you will see in the end is that Ashley MacArthur had the motive to kill Taylor Wright, money. She had the opportunity to kill Taylor Wright. She did in fact kill Taylor Wright. And then she tried to cover it up. But to get to that ending, we have to start at the beginning. In mid 2017, Taylor Wright, the deceased in this case, was entangled in some court proceedings and some financial issues with her ex-husband, Jeff Wright. And while that was all going on, Taylor Wright withdrew $100,000 from the bank when she wasn't supposed to. And then she was trying to hide that money from her ex-husband. 
Taylor was transferring money to other accounts. She was withdrawing cash. She was taking out cashier's checks. And she also asked her friend, this defendant, Ashley MacArthur, to help hide the money. Now, Ashley MacArthur, at the time, was running a business that her parents opened some time ago called Pensacola Automatic Amusement. And they supplied pool tables, jukeboxes, video games to local bars and businesses. One of those businesses that Ashley worked with was Sticks Billiards or Sticks Pool Hall. And you will hear that Ashley MacArthur was romantically involved with the owner of that bar. And the only reason that matters for your purposes is because she was trying to help his business financially. And she was also spending a lot of money on him personally. So at the time when Taylor Wright is trying to hide this money from her ex-husband, Ashley MacArthur had a number of bank accounts, personal and business. And on August 10th of 2017, Ashley MacArthur added Taylor Wright to one of those accounts. A few weeks after that, in early September of 2017, Taylor Wright had a court date that was coming up with her ex-husband. And Taylor told this defendant, Ashley MacArthur, repeatedly that she needed to get to the bank. She needed to get to the bank, she needed to get her money out, and she needed to put it in an escrow account with this mess with her ex-husband or she was gonna be in trouble with the court. You will see those text messages, and the reason they're important is because you will see the pressure that Taylor Wright was putting on Ashley MacArthur to get this money. And the reason that matters is because the money was gone. Ashley MacArthur had spent it. There is no question that what happened to Taylor Wright is a tragedy. No one in this courtroom is going to dispute that. On October 19, 2017, Taylor Wright's body was found in a shallow grave off a fence line on the Britt family farm with a gunshot wound to the back of her head. Now, during this trial, there will be no evidence introduced showing you exactly when and where Taylor Wright was killed. What the evidence is going to show you is that sometime around September 8, 2017, that was a Friday, into September 9, 2017, that Taylor Wright stopped communicating with people she knew. But you're going to learn from the evidence that that was not exactly surprising for Taylor Wright, given everything that she had going on in her life at that time. The defense went on to attempt to place doubt in the jurors' minds that Ashley had any involvement in Taylor's death at all. They did this by outlining several issues that Taylor was dealing with in her personal life, including a nasty divorce and a lingering financial problem between Taylor and her ex. They would also attempt to paint Taylor's girlfriend Cassandra as a volatile and aggressive person that they believe should have been investigated further. The evidence in this case was quite overwhelming, and so the defense's attempt to create reasonable doubt within the jury fell flat. Ashley's trial only lasted four days, including jury deliberation. And on August 30th, just after 2 p.m., Ashley MacArthur received her sentence. Let's bring the jury in. Do you have a pen on that? All right, and for the everybody may have a seat, and for the record, defendant is present with counsel, assistant state attorney is present. Are you Mr. No. Who's my poor person? Who's got the... Mr. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Were y'all able to reach a verdict? Okay, all I want you to do is to hand it to court security, okay? Thank you. I'm going to hand it to the clerk to publish. Yes. In the circuit court in and for Escambia County, Florida, State of Florida versus Ashley Britt MacArthur, case number 1717CF005844A, 1717 verdict as to the charge in count one, we 
we the jury find the defendant Ashley MacArthur guilty of first degree premeditated murder with a firearm as charged in the indictment. So say we all, or a person dated August 30th, 2019. Is this your individual verdict as well as the verdict of the jury as a whole? Just be a minute. Is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Is this yes, your is. verdict? Is yes, this it your is. Verdict? Is this your verdict? Yes, it is. 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 Ashley MacArthur was sentenced to life in prison.